Good evening. My name is Barb Bodwin, and I am the co-interim director of the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event, sponsored by the Harvard Museum of Natural History and in conjunction with the Harvard University Office for Sustainability. It is now my pleasure to introduce William Clark, the Harvey Brooks Professor of International Science, Public Policy, and Human Development at the Harvard Kennedy School, who will introduce our speaker. Welcome, Bill. Barb, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to all of you who are joining us here at this Harvard Museum's discussion of one of the great questions of our time. That is, how can capitalism play a positive role in tackling our overlapping crises of economic stagnation, social inequality, environmental destruction, and a plummeting trust in our leaders and institutions? To help us think about and think about how to act on this question, I can imagine no better guide than our session speaker, Rebecca Henderson. As you'll see in the announcement for the session, she is one of Harvard's rarest creatures, a professor not only in the business school, but one of our only uh, 25 university professors. That is, she ranks me. Uh, this means she's a distinguished scholar, an exceptionally distinguished scholar, uh, a teacher whose praises make the rest of us just think, why are we even in this business? Uh, a specialist in subjects ranging from organizational purpose, innovation, productivity in high performance organizations, and on and on and on. Um, so we can take her scholarship for granted. Uh, what I can testify to is that she is also an appallingly accomplished activist and agent of change. I had the privilege of uh, working as her co-chair in uh, former president, Harvard President Drew Faust's committee uh, that uh, explored what Harvard should be doing about its uh, reduction in greenhouse gases and so on. And uh, Rebecca was the central figure in bringing that committee and eventually Harvard and its corporation uh, to a commitment to go to uh, fossil fuel free by the year 2050 and fossil fuel neutral by the year 2026. Uh, she has moved uh, on uh, beyond that to become for President Bacow, uh, the co-chair of his uh, presidential committee uh, on sustainability, um, a group uh, that the university and its leadership team are looking to, to define our vision, business goals, strategy, partnerships for the future. She's playing similar roles for many corporations uh, through her work on uh, multiple boards uh, around the world. Uh, tonight, we have the treat of Rebecca speaking to us on this combination of her scholarship and uh, active agent of change uh, uh, in the context of her uh, recently published book, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. Uh, this is a great book, one of the things that drives other academics like me to think, why are we even in this business? Um, it's scholarly, it is short, uh, it uh, speaks with uh, a combination of uh, deep engagement uh, with the theory and scholarship, but uh, better yet, a deep engagement with the particular experiences of particular companies in the world and an absolutely frank and honest presentation of their strengths, weaknesses, failures, and accomplishments. Uh, her book and Rebecca are presently shortlisted for the Financial Times McKinsey Best Business Book of the Year, a tremendous honor. Uh, we have the honor of having her addressing us tonight, uh, Professor Rebecca Henderson. Bill, thank you for that incredibly generous introduction. I really appreciate it. And, uh, and it makes me feel a little uneasy, particularly because uh, you are, of course, not correct. You are one of the world's leading scholars of sustainability. And uh, our committee would never have been as successful as we were without your amazing leadership and partnership. So thank you very, very much for your kind words. My thanks to everyone who's tuned in this evening. I know that at this crazy and difficult time, to add to all the uncertainty that we face, uh, we have to sit on Zoom <laughs> to watch people. And I wish we were in that beautiful lecture hall at the Harvard Museum of National Natural History, gathered together to talk about the book. 
but this is a lot better than nothing. So uh, let me try and give you some sense for what my book's about and why I think reimagining capitalism might be so important. By way of introduction, let me tell you how I came to write this book. It all started about 15 years ago when I was teaching at MIT. I was the Eastman Kodak Professor of Management, and while that was a coincidence, it was a deeply ironic one because that's what I was doing. I was working with large firms trying to understand why they found it so difficult to respond to major changes in their environment. And I was beginning to work with energy companies who were arriving in my office and saying, you know, we think we need to transform, but we're not sure how. And at about that time, I happened to see Vice President Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. My brother had been sharing papers about the science of climate change with me for some time. He's a freelance environmental journalist. And so I had a general sense that climate change was an issue and maybe I should be thinking about it. But um, An Inconvenient Truth really crystallized that idea for me. I sent an email to everyone in my contact list, something I haven't done before or since, saying, you know, climate change is an existential threat facing the planet and we have to do something. And then I found myself wondering what I should do. My first thought was to quit. It felt to me that teaching MBAs was rather beside the point when we were facing such enormous risks of dislocation and huge threats to vulnerable populations across the world. But my friends in the NGO community persuaded me to stay where I was. And I found myself really for the first time integrating two parts of myself. I'd always been a passionate hiker and an avid outdoors person, but I had never really connected that with my day-to-day -day work. And what I found myself doing with a wonderful colleague called Professor John Sturman was teaching the first course in sustainable business at MIT. It was an amazing course. We looked at the role that individual firms could play in making a difference against the climate crisis. But as it went on, I found it ultimately unsatisfying. I thought, yes, firms can make a big difference, but will it really add up to the wholesale change in our politics and our culture that I believed and continue to believe are necessary to solve problems like climate change? And I also became very deeply engaged in thinking about inequality and what we could do about another massive, supposedly public goods problem. How could we solve these enormous problems and how could business help? So 10 years ago, I moved to the Harvard Business School and started teaching a course called Reimagining Capitalism, Business and the Big Problems. And it really was a course about what business could do to help drive these huge changes that we need. And I will say at the beginning, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, we taught some cases about firms that were making a difference. I brought guests to class who were thinking about these larger questions. And uh, over time, the students and I sort of worked out what might work. So what I came to was what I think is a pragmatic, grounded, possible framework about how business could help save the world. A very unlikely idea, and I'm the last person to say, well, this is a done deal, but I do think business could make a big difference, and I think I have some sense of how. My students asked me to write it down because they found the ideas from the course really interesting and wanted to talk about it with their friends. And so that's the book I've written, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. Let me see if I can summarize that for you in 10 to 15 minutes. So first, why reimagine capitalism? Why not simply throw it out? Uh, many groups that I work with say, well, you know, capitalism's irretrievably broken. Let's just get rid of it. And I understand where that feeling is coming from. Uh, the problems we face seem immense and intractable and business so often seems to be contributing to them. But I'm an economist and a business school professor, and I've spent my whole career working with companies. And I have come to believe that genuinely free and fair markets with real competition, where everyone can participate, are one of the great inventions of the human race. And we will not solve the problems we face without them. But I don't think that at the moment, 
we have a capitalism that can deliver against that promise. I think our capitalism is badly broken. And for me, the nature of that brokenness is caught by my favorite cartoon, which is by the New Yorker columnist, Tom Toro, and the New Yorker cartoonist, Tom Toro. And he shows a, a group of ragged children sitting around a campfire in front of what's clearly the ruins of civilization. And a man in a ragged business suit is saying, well, we did destroy the whole planet. But for a beautiful moment in time, we created a great deal of shareholder value. And that, for me, captures in an image what's wrong with our current moment. Many business people came to believe that their only job in life was putting their head down and focusing on maximizing shareholder value and making as much money as possible. And I think we forgot that business is an integral part of society and has an important moral responsibility to the health of the institutions in which it's embedded. And that the long-term goal of business is not to maximize profits, it never was, but to create a thriving, prosperous and just society in a sustainable world. So what does that mean on the ground? And could it ever happen that business changed in that kind of way? So, let me give you a sense of what that might look like in practice. And to do that, I want to tell you a story about my friend, Eric Osmundson. Eric left a cushy job in private equity to become the CEO of a garbage company. This might seem like a slightly odd career move, but Eric wanted to make a difference. And changing the way we handle trash could reduce global emissions by hundreds of millions of tons. Right away, Eric ran into very serious problems. He discovered that the industry was thoroughly corrupt. Firms were cutting costs by dumping waste illegally. The fines for violations of the rules were tiny and uh, very rarely enforced. Eric decided that he was going to run clean and to raise prices to cover the costs of doing so. Most of his senior team thought he was crazy. Half of them quit. So did many of his customers. But others stepped up. His employees, those who remained, were thrilled at the idea of working for a company that was going to be really finding a solution to the problems of waste. And they started to find all kinds of ways to cut costs legally. In the process, reinventing how we think about recycling and creating an innovation powerhouse. He was fortunate enough to have purpose-driven investors who understood that it might take a while to turn the company and the industry around and were willing to let him try. He was able to persuade several of his competitors to join him in refusing, in refusing to dump waste illegally and it got harder and harder for regulators to stay on the sidelines. Now Eric runs Norsk Genvinning, one of the largest recycling companies in Scandinavia. And he would be the first to tell you that it wasn't him, that he had a team, that it was hard, that he's not perfect, but he has helped drive a complete transformation of the waste business in Scandinavia from the old style, dump the garbage in a hole in the ground to high tech recycling. And in doing so has helped advance the idea of building a truly circular economy in which our waste stream becomes an important source of raw materials and garbage emits much less uh, global emissions in the process. So can we generalize? I think we can. I think many firms are discovering that becoming purpose-driven, that is understanding that their goal is not to maximize shareholder returns, that giving a decent return to investors and making profits is a means to an end, not the end in itself, but that the end is solving tough public problems, whether it's creating uh, giving everyone soap and toothpaste, or making sure that we really transition to a carbon-free economy. And they are finding that if you run as an authentically purpose-driven firm, 
if you implement a, what I call a high road business model, that is you treat people with dignity and respect, give them a decent wage and reasonable benefits, and most importantly, decentralize power so that people can make the decisions that uh, will drive the business forward on their own account. If you can do that, you see literally order of magnitude improvements in productivity and innovation. And the scholarly research in this area is getting stronger and stronger, showing that this really may be, in some circumstances, a better way to run the firm. These kinds of purpose-driven firms are demonstrating new business models, like Eric in Scandinavia, showing that trying to build a circular economy or building um, a carbon-free econ uh, a carbon-free industry or paying people well is not only profitable but uh, but eminently possible. Individual firms working on their own is of course not enough, and so. What we're seeing is firms joining together to try and address problems for which there is no individual business case. So for example, Unilever decided that it wanted to use a sustainable palm oil. And because they were under significant pressure from their consumers and activists for the deforestation that the planting and consumption of palm oil is driving in countries like Indonesia. But using sustainable palm oil was expensive and they could not afford it, otherwise they would have lost business. So they went to the other large consumer goods companies and said, why don't we all do this? Why don't we join together? And if we all use sustainable palm oil, none of us will be at a competitive disadvantage and we may address this major global problem. This kind of collective self-regulation has met with mixed success. It's difficult to sustain this kind of cooperation amongst these very large firms, particularly when there are nearly always firms who are bottom feeders and don't want to cooperate. But in the process of trying to build these collective uh, movements, they have uh, begun to realize that what they need is someone to make sure that corporations have to do the right thing. So purpose-driven firms have a strong business case for making sure that those who are not willing to do the right thing can be brought up to scratch. And there are two ways that might discipline firms in this way. The first is through the capital markets. I talk in my book about the need to rewire finance, how important it is that investors develop new metrics through which to measure companies, and a new understanding that unless we solve problems like climate change and inequality, the long-term returns um, that uh, are needed by so much of the world's money, the pension funds and the sovereign wealth funds, will not be forthcoming. I talk about... Uh, Hiro Mizuna, who was the chief investment officer of the Japanese pension fund, and came to believe that his fiduciary duty required him to address the problem of climate change and to push all the firms in his portfolio to do so. Then the last group that can discipline firms is, of course, government. And the really out there thing I suggest is that business has a strong economic case for rebuilding our institutions that everything we know about political development and the building of prosperous societies is that they rest on three foundations. The free market, a democratically accountable, transparent, capable government, and strong civil society. And that we've let business become too powerful. And for its own sake, for the sake of the long-term survival of the economy, as well as our societies and the planet, it's really important that business get involved in civics, that business leaders lead the charge for the repeal of legislation like Citizen United, that they insist we get money out of politics, that they insist that everybody has the chance to vote, and that they say that uh, things like gerrymandering is just as unacceptable as rampant discrimination against LGBTQ plus people or uh, people of color. It sounds a little crazy, but it has happened before. Business has worked with governments and with representatives of civil society, particular employees, rep employee representatives, to build a stronger society. So that's the story. That's what, how I think we might, or how business might help save the world. Let me talk for a moment about your role in this. 
because sometimes it seems as if only CEOs can do anything, but that's really not the case. <laughs> One of the things I discovered in my, uh, in my research for the book is that behind every purpose-driven CEO, there are nearly always many purpose-driven employees. I tell the story of Michelle Legens, who became the brand manager for Lipton Tea, which was not even remotely a sexy product. Teabag tea was and is a commodity under enormous price pressure. It was not the place you went to really differentiate yourself or build a great career. But when Michelle got to the position, he found that a group of his colleagues had been working on growing sustainable tea for years, but they believed that unless tea production became more sustainable, there wouldn't be any tea. So Michelle worked with them to formulate the proposition that Unilever should commit to growing only sustainable tea. His bosses initially thought he was crazy. It took them at least six months to persuade them to give this very unorthodox strategy a try. But once they did, they found not that consumers were willing to pay more, but that they were willing to switch. That if you gave them great tea uh, at the same price and made it clear that this was sustainably grown, a significant fraction of consumers would switch. They also found that their employees got super excited in the way I described. It generated enormous engagement and focus inside the brand. And, uh, and I could go on, but, but really they changed how Unilever grows tea. And that shift inside Lipton Tea is one of the reasons that Paul Pullman, who is one of the most outstanding and successful, sustainable uh, CEOs of our time, that's one of the reasons he had the courage to try and make the whole firm more sustainable. So if you're an employee, look around. Think about what can be done in your company and where you work. And if you're not an employee or you work in the nonprofit sector, um, join in putting pressure on corporations. You're a consumer. You're an investor. Make sure that the firms you buy from and the firms you invest in are moving in this direction. You're also a neighbor. We know from the social psychology literature that if you start to take these ideas seriously, if you decide to eat less red meat and fly less and put social, uh, solar panels on your roof, it won't change the world because we're all small and individual, but it significantly increases that the odds that other people will do the same thing. It will also make you feel a lot better in my experience. And last but not least, you're a citizen. The only way that in the end we will address the problems we face is by rebuilding our democracy so that it reflects the will of everyone in the country and addresses the massive problems like climate change and environmental damage and inequality that we face. So vote and persuade your friends to vote. Let me close, if I could, by reading an extract from my book. Uh, this is from the preface. And uh, it talks a little bit about how tough it can be to do this work from day to day. I do not suggest that reimagining capitalism will be easy or cheap. My career has given me extensive first-hand experience of just how difficult it is to do things in new ways. For many years, I worked with firms struggling to change. I worked with GM as it attempted to respond to Toyota with Kodak as the conventional film business collapsed in the face of digital photography, with Nokia, which at its peak sold more than half of the world's cell phones as Apple revolutionized the business. Transforming the world's firms will be hard. Transforming the world's social and political systems will be even harder, but it is eminently possible. And if you look around, you can see it happening. I am reminded of a moment some years ago when I was in Finland facilitating a business retreat. It was the first and last time that my agenda has included the item 5 p.m. sauna. Following instructions, I showed up for the sauna, took off all my clothes and soaked up the heat. And now my host instructed me, it's time to jump into the lake. I duly ran across the snow, everyone else carefully averting their eyes. The Finns are very polite about such things and carefully climbed down a metal ladder 
through the hole that had been cut in the ice and into the lake. There was a pause. My host arrived at the top of the ladder and looked down at me. You know, she said, I don't think I feel like lake, lake bathing today. I spend a good chunk of my time now working with business people who are thinking of doing things differently. They can see the need for change. They can even see a way forward, but they hesitate. They are busy and they don't feel like doing it today. It sometimes seems as if I'm still at the bottom of that ladder, looking up, waiting for others to take the risk of acting in new and sometimes uncomfortable ways. But I am hopeful. I know three things. First, I know that this is what change feels like. Challenging the status quo is difficult and often cold and lonely. We shouldn't be surprised that the interests that pushed climate denialism for many years are now pushing the idea that there's nothing we can do about it. That's how powerful incumbents always react to the prospect of change. Second, I am sure it can be done. We have the technology and the resources to fix the problems we face. Humans are infinitely resourceful. If we decide to rebuild our institutions, build a completely circular economy, and halt the damage we are causing to the natural world, we can. Last, I am convinced that we have a secret weapon. I spent 20 years of my life working with firms that were trying to transform themselves. I learned that having the right strategy was important and that redesigning the organization was also critical. But mostly, I learned that these were necessary but not sufficient conditions. The firms that mastered change were those that had a reason to do so, the ones that had a purpose greater than simply maximizing profits. People who believe that their work has a meaning beyond themselves can accomplish amazing things. And we have the opportunity to mobilize shared purpose at a global scale. This is not easy work. It sometimes feels exactly like climbing down a metal ladder into a hole cut through foot thick ice. But here's the thing. While taking the plunge is hard, it is also exhilarating. Doing something different makes you feel alive. Being surrounded by friends and allies, fighting to protect the things you love, makes life feel rich and often hopeful. It is worth braving the cold. Join me. We have a world to save. Rebecca, thank you very much. Um, I have uh, had the pleasure of listening to a couple of your many talks on related subjects. Um, and it never ceases to amaze me how you continue to weave new perspectives, uh, new things mere mortals can do, who don't happen to be CEOs of, of uh, big companies, uh, and a sense of realistic hope uh, into your presentations. So um, uh, yet again, thank you so much for your leadership and inspiration in this. Now, to the audience, um, we're going to spend the next half hour or so on questions and answers. Rebecca, I wanted to uh, ask you, as you stand back and look at the classes of business school teachers, cases, business school students you teach right now at Harvard, um, what fraction of them buy into this? versus which fraction of them listen to it, respectful of your leadership in the field, but to the extent that you know when they go off to their interviews or whatever, are basically comfortable to toe the line, uh, not jump in the ice pit and so on. Um, I just, we, we've had a couple of questions about, is this just a thing of a particular generation? How is it resonating with different uh, age classes of, of students and young professionals and so on. So comment a bit on the next generation into this war. So oh, I've been teaching for more than 30 years. And over that time, the center of gravity in the MBA class has really shifted. When I first began teaching a course on sustainable business at MIT 15 years ago, maybe 20% of the class took the course. It was an elective. Ten years ago, when I started teaching Reimagining Capitalism at the Harvard Business School, I started with 28 students. 
And the next year, 328 signed up. That was about a third of the second year class. And that's remained the sort of steady state enrollment in that class. So I would say about a third of the MBA class are really serious about this. That doesn't mean that they agree with me. <laughs> they have a most refreshing cynicism, but they think something is badly wrong and that business should help. And so what the class talks about is, well, what is wrong and how could business help? This year, I moved for the first time to become the course head for HBS's class in leadership, corporate governance and ethics. So I'm teaching the whole first year. And in that first year, I would say that at least 80% of the students understand that not everything is going well. How many of them will decide to devote their careers to it right out of school? I'm not sure, but maybe 25 to 30%. Students are, are reaching out to me all the time saying, what can I do? Who should I work for? How can I make a difference? And I think many more are open to the idea that business has a broader responsibility than just putting its head down and making money. Thank you. Um, still sticking on the issue of what particular people currently enrolled in business schools do. We have a question from, from Lewis about um, the uh, implications of your thinking for startups. Um, fine if you're well capitalized, if you're a Unilever or a Patagonia and so on, and have, to your credit, built up a good bit of slack that you can use to experiment. But if you're just trying to start up and uh, bring new capital on board, can you connect that query to your question about financial markets and so on? For sure. I actually think that entrepreneurial firms are one of the most important levers for change that we have. The good news is that there's more and more capital looking to fund small firms that want to try doing things differently. By some measures, about a third of the world's financial capital, that's maybe $40 trillion, depending on how you measure it, is committed to so-called sustainable or ESG investing. And there are increasingly so-called impact investors who are focused exclusively on firms that they think can make a difference. I have a friend called Renia Imdahl, who uh, founded a private equity firm called Summa Equity, whose mandate is to invest in small firms that are addressing the sustainable development goals. And he was able to raise, don't quote me on this, but some fraction of a billion dollars on his first firm. Uh, on his first fund, and that fund made super normal returns, and the firms in that portfolio are getting higher than average via valuations, and he's in the midst of raising a second fund, and he's being, you know, pretty much getting money thrown at him. Um, investors are coming to see that these small firms that are trying to really change industries to address problems of sustainability and inequality are potentially an enormous source of growth. Uh, everyone knows the Tesla example, and Elon Musk, of course, was able to use his own money to get going, but he's really transforming the automotive example. You may also know about the entrepreneurial firms in plant-based foods, where a, uh, a, essentially a veggie burger company, a very high-tech veggie burger company called Beyond Meat, had the most successful IPO over $200 million in the last 20 years. And another firm in that space, Impossible Foods, is, has a valuation that you would not believe and is just growing so fast they can hardly manage it. This is happening in industry after industry. So it's not just in recycling where Norsk Genvinning has done so well, but also in um, industries like construction and infrastructure, and of course in renewable energy, where many of the early firms were highly purpose-driven and some of them have been hugely successful. So I think startups are a really critical piece of this puzzle and, and every day, every week for sure, I get an email with what seems like this wild and crazy idea. Let, let's use blockchain to label tuna fish to address the overfishing problem. Let's mine nodules from the ocean floor so we don't have to keep digging in very dirty ways for the kinds of minerals we use. Incredible imagination in these new business models. And so it's one of the things that makes me really optimistic about the future. Thank you. 
Um, so again, let me encourage the uh, folks out there who are listening to keep scanning the list of questions that have been posed because I really am trying to deal off the top of the deck. Um, on that, um, let me again follow up in this theme of you've, you've stressed in your book and in your remarks today, uh, the clear importance of uh, enlightened leadership in corporations, whether they are at the startup level in ideas or for large established corporations like Pullman and, and Unilever. But let's come down to the structural issues. And we have a question here as to whether um, part of the leverage here is in the current alternatives for structuring businesses and their responsibilities. And, and uh, uh, specifically, um, uh, uh, Jesse asks, do you believe this can be done best under existing ways of structuring business, or do you have proposals of new ways to structure, such as B corporations or some of the other new uh, forms that are out there? Is, is this structural part a big complement to the individual initiative and leadership part, a little one, or what? Jesse, thank you. I think this is an important complement, but for a relatively small fraction of firms. So choosing to incorporate as something like a B corporation or a benefit corporation is to say to investors, our goal is explicitly to create the social good as well as to deliver investor returns. And that can be a very powerful way of attracting the kinds of investors you want. That corporate form in particular doesn't shelter you from angry investors who believe that, whoa, you aren't giving them enough profit. They can still vote you out and put in new management that does a very different thing. And many firms, I think, are going to have a very hard time switching their governance structure because their investors are going to say, no, no, trust us. We understand about the need to invest in the long term. Um, so I think while these sort of voluntary shifts can be important to some firms, they're not going to move the whole economy. Some people believe that unilaterally changing the forms of corporate governance across the world and in the US in particular would really help. I think if it were done carefully, some changes to corporate law might make a big difference. For example, um, getting rid of something called Revlon duties would I think be an important move forward because it's one of the reasons that firms are sometimes very short sighted and focused on sort of maximizing quarterly profits right now. But in general, the investors call the shots. And really changing that by, for example, putting employees on the board or by uh, giving uh, the corporation a different purpose requires changes right across society in the way government is run, in the way the investors think, in the role of, of labor in, uh, in participating in these kinds of conversations. And the good news is that existing corporate law gives most companies a lot of wiggle room. There is no legal duty in the U.S. to maximize short-term shareholder value. The fiduciary duties of directors are care, candor, and loyalty, and to the long-term health of the corporation. Apart from very particular moments, such as those triggered under Revlon, corporations do not have to maximize short-term returns. If they can persuade investors that what they want to do is in the long-term interest of the corporation, no one is going to sue them from, uh, from, from, doing it, from, from doing it. The real pressures on corporations come from investors. And uh, so that's why rewiring finance is so important. And I think it's also really important that we have appropriate government action. Because although I, while I think, for example, firms can make a long, a, a long, a great deal of progress on problems like climate change, without sensible regulations, without appropriate taxes, we are not going to address the global nature of climate change or inequality. And so that's why I think ultimately what we need to do is rebuild our institutions and begin to build global institutions to address these problems. Thank you. Um, okay, so let me follow up on that. We've got a series of questions here that do this stand back from the activities within the particular corporations or even capital system itself and think of the context within which they operate. And for a little bit of context on that, I'll say that beyond the conversation about what capitalism or the private sector should be doing. There's now a growing literature in the scholarship on sustainability looking historically about how big transitions in how we organize ourselves 
to essentially use the planet, use people to advance well-being, that uh, addresses this theme you have in your book about incremental innovation versus uh, versus uh, um, discontinuous architectural. discontinuous archite your architectural innovation. They talk about it as adaptation versus transitions. And the big argument in transitions on that literature is that two big things stand in your way. One, you've addressed squarely head on in your book, which is just imagining that a future could be different than a mere continuation of present stuff. And I'll put that aside for the moment because you've sketched it so nicely and it's so critical and important. But the second part of that is that it isn't just we're doing things that have some bad consequences. It's that a lot of people have deeply vested interests in continuing to do them exactly that way. Uh, Mimi raises this question about the, uh, you know, appalling power uh, held by some of the big energy companies in shaping our political discourse, our rules and our regulations. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, there are, there's a set of comments uh, coming from Claire and others on the uh, problem of, yeah, it's good to go at this by investor pressure, but if investors find themselves deeply dependent on not only their investments in, but their continuing donations from uh, large empowered corporations, how do you see yourself breaking these places where there's a power lock uh, in preference to the status quo, opposing these reimagined visions of where to go forward in 25 words or less? So for sure, this concentrated power that is in support of the existing status quo is a huge problem. One of the reasons we're in the mess we are now is that the large fossil fuel companies in the US have spent hundreds of millions of dollars denying the reality of climate change, flooding the political system with money, and uh, not just at the federal level, but at the state and local levels, and generally doing all they can to prevent any form of meaningful action in response. So I think there are three constituencies that can fight back against this power. The first is government and the people. And this you see in Europe, where the large fossil fuel companies are, I think, much further along in understanding that they need to transition. We have the example of BP, which just a few weeks ago devoted an entire week to explaining to its investors how it was going to change. And I think was so persuasive that it really was going to change that it lost 25% of its share, share value. It's really right. striking. Um, just as when uh, the Walmart CEO announced he was going to raise wages for everyone that worked for him and it would be good in the long term, uh, Walmart stock like, lost like 20% of its value. So these are companies that are authentically committing to do something different, so really believing that, uh, that they will get higher valuations in the end, which of course is, is what's happened to Walmart. So that was good news and I'm sure it will happen to BP. So government and popular pressure can make, make an enormous difference. So when I say vote and I see someone in the, in the question say, well, why do I mention vote last? Well, because I think it's the most important thing. I'm building up to it. Um, I think democratic action is absolutely critical if we are to drive change. There are a couple of other levers we can push. One is the capital markets. More and more, the big investors are starting to believe that climate change poses an existential risk to the future of the economy. The uh, last governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, is very clear that he thinks this is a risk much, much greater than the kind of um, upset we suffered in 2008, that it could dislocate the entire financial economy. And most recently, the U.S. Commodities Future Trading Commission, uh, an uh, a body governed by this administration issued a report on the financial risk of climate change whose first words were, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but the largest risk facing our economy is climate change. Mm -hmm. 
And so I think investors are increasingly pushing the firms in their portfolio for concrete measures of how they're going to transition away from fossil fuels. They want to see transparency on political spending. They want to see how we're going to get out of here. And so groups like Climate Action 100 are pushing the 100 largest carbon emitters to be very clear about how they get off uh, carbon. We have folks like Larry Fink, who controls more than seven trillion in assets, saying, I am going to vote against the boards of companies that do not have a plan to get off carbon. So investors may help us. I am hopeful that all the other companies, not fossil fuel companies, will also help. That many of them understand deeply that letting climate change rip is a fundamental threat to the future of their business models. It's often said that if, if COVID is the pop test, climate change is the final exam, and this is not looking good. So I am very hopeful that uh, the uh, big CEOs will increasingly say and will increasingly put pressure on the fossil fuel companies to say, look, you've got to stop. So last but not least, let me address Claire's question, because I can see that's been, you know, upvoted. And of course, here we are at Harvard. So let's talk about what institutions can do. I think it's very important that institutions have a clear eyed sense of who they're taking money from and who they're investing in. I myself am a believer in engagement, at least in the short term, rather than divestment. Because I think we're going to need these big fossil fuel companies. We're going to need their assets. We're going to need their capital. Most of all, we need them to stop doing some of the horrible stuff they're doing right now. And that simply divesting uh, throws away an important tool. And simply saying, I won't work with you, throws away an important tool. So my personal preferred course of action is to say, well, we're happy to work with you. We will invest in you, but we want to see a very clear path forward. We want clear milestones. We want to have a sense of what you're doing. And if you do not meet those milestones, then we will consider and will break our relationships with you and we will choose to divest. And that's really the approach picked by the, uh, used by the investors in Climate Action 100. And there's some sign that it's making a difference. So I'm hopeful that with action on all of these fronts, we will be able to overcome this kind of concentrated power and persuade those fossil fuel companies who are still sticking their heels in the sand that they need to change. We teach a course on Exxon, we teach a case on Exxon in Reimagining Capitalism and their refusal to write down the value of their oil reserves, despite the fact that oil prices are falling and that demand for oil is declining and that there's enormous political pressure to stop burning the stuff completely. And at the end of the class, the students look at each other and say, could Exxon be Kodak? It, and I yep. think that's right. <laughs> I think the smart fossil fuel companies are increasingly waking up to the idea that sticking to business as usual is a total dead end and, uh, and are beginning to change. But we need to keep the pressure up as hard and as consistently as we can. Thank you. Um, you say in your book um, that uh, though there have been instances of uh, firms that are part of the capitalist system transforming themselves uh, just by a positive moral leadership position they're going to do so, but that many of the transformations we have seen come in response to or at least closely tied up with big shocks to the system. Um, and the more general case would say, yes, yeah, shocks are really important. Uh, they're what get people to come to grapple with the fact that just keeping doing it the way we're doing it may not work. So um, we have a specific question from Romar about whether the uh, current COVID related shocks um, are likely to provide an opportunity um, that is especially open to the kind of transformations you're suggesting or rather one that will, I'm now interpolating, uh, be more likely to result in retrenchment and saying, well, we can get along to these transformations once we've got our normal economy back in place? I do not know. I will tell you what I believe to be true, but I'm very much aware that I may be wrong. 
So it may be the case that we come out of the pandemic poorer and angrier and decide that we don't have time to deal with these major challenges. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think there may be a silver lining to the incredibly difficult time we are living through. And I think that may be for a number of reasons. One is COVID demonstrates that really bad things can happen. So many senior managers I've spoken to have said to me, I used to set up my supply chains for low cost and efficiency. Now I realize that I have to manage for resilience, that this world is much more uncertain than I had anticipated, and that I really need to, to think much more broadly about what's happening. Secondly, I think what the pandemic has taught us is our total interdependence. At the root of the shareholder value maximization at any cost is the illusion that if I just stay in my silo and take care of myself, I'll be fine. And what the pandemic shows us in spades is that that's not true, that we literally have to take our neighbor's health seriously if we are to build a healthy society. So I think, you know, talking about interdependence, focusing on the long term, all of that's become easier with the pandemic and more aware. The pandemic has vividly illustrated, I think, that inequality is not just some like, oh, yeah, maybe there are a few poor people over there, but I bet they just don't work hard enough, but has really made very clear the idea that there are people who cannot afford not to put themselves in harm's way that those we call essential workers often have to work two jobs, don't have health benefits, and are struggling to take care of their children and do their jobs at the same time. And I think we now have names and faces to these people and that a sense, I hope, that addressing inequality is one of the most pressing challenges we face. And I think Mr. Floyd's death and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter has really highlighted the fact that we can't just hope that someone take, else takes care of the problem of inclusion, that it is centrally important that all of us take responsibility for making sure that people are color, of color feel welcomed and included and promoted and have access to the resources that they need to thrive. And last but not least, I think what COVID has illustrated is the idea that you should drown government in the bathtub is a really bad one. That as we look across the world, the correlation between a democratically accountable, widely legitimate, capable government, having a government like that and not having a government like that is literally a matter of life and death. And that it's very clear that a thriving economy requires institutions that work and a thriving democracy. So I published this piece called The Business Case for Saving Democracy. And I really believe it. And I think many business people are beginning to understand that if business is to thrive, free markets need free politics. Thank you. Um, I want to sit here and think and follow up and so on, but I will, I will try to avoid that. Um, let me turn as we come to the end of at least the formal session here um, to the fact that we're conducting this discussion within a university setting. Uh, you're an educator, I'm an educator. Um, we've got several questions, um, uh, maybe most notably from Kyle on, if you were thinking for the long run, not just what do you teach in your courses to business school students who have already signaled they're interested in this problem, but how would you change the basic education we give in our uh, high schools or even just focus on our colleges about the role of business, the role of agency, um, the uh, both potential contributions and the potential uh, uh, negative impacts of, uh, of free marketeering versus public goods creation versus whatever. How would you change how we do education? Uh, Bill, 
you wouldn't answer that question for me, would you? <laughs> See, no, <ma> you're <laughs> one of the world's experts in sustainability science and how we should think about this problem across universities and in our educational system. Um, so <laughs> I think it's well, wildly well, unfair. Start, start, start with the level. When you think of what you're teaching now, uh -huh. in um, in your B-School courses versus what you or your predecessors might have been teaching 20 years ago. So um, for sure. Beyond the vision and reframing part, right. particular skills, particular frameworks for thinking. Um, yes, your book, I get it. But come down and help so, people no, out no, no, a little no. more. So I think people are asking it, for, what should I learn more about? Right. So I think the... There are two things it's important to learn more about. The first is the basics of what's actually happening to our world. So what does climate change mean? How fast is it happening? What's the evidence we have that it's going to cause harm? What sorts of solutions are available? Why is inequality increasing? what kinds of societies in what kinds of places have solved it and how. I think we need much more knowledge about how the world works and what's happening. And the last thing I would, would teach much more of is, is what used to be called civics or political economy, which is how have different societies solved these problems? What does the free market do well and what does it do horribly? What do we know about when democracy has worked and when it hasn't? What do we know about the role of this nebulous but incredibly important thing I talk about, civil society? How do we build societies with high levels of trust and mutual levels of regard? where we come to see ourselves as part of a larger whole. Yes, individuals with our own journeys and, and uh, freedom of movement, but also part of something much, much larger. M my interpretation of most of the great faith traditions is that they just, that focusing right now is a deeply unskillful way to live and that we have to learn to rebalance our societies and ourselves so we also focus on us and later. In my book, I think I focus too little on the importance of individual transformation, on the role that each of us thinking through who we want to be in the world and where we want to go can play in driving the transition. So last but not least, I think in our education, we need to support everyone in thinking through what do they want from life? What is the meaning of this crazy, beautiful journey that we're all sharing together? And how can they play a role in building the kind of society in which they want to live? Excellent questions um, and challenging to teach. Um, let me then make my make my last pitch here. Several people, I think, uh, just looking at their questions and the chatter here, are convinced that they would like to learn more. I hope they go out and buy your book. Um, you gave me one, but I also bought three copies that I've now distributed to my family and so on. Um, but for trying to keep up, what is it that you would have the the, if there is such a thing, the typical participant in this discussion, the one who came to this because they were already interested, what would you have them read or follow to keep up with how thinking about reimagining capitalism, progress, failures, what works, what doesn't, what do they stick with? Last, that's your last question. Um, I would recommend Bloomberg Green which tracks companies doing new things in this area and talks about the policies surrounding them, and grist.org for the same reason. If you're interested in climate change and politics, I would recommend subscribing to the newsletter Heated, which is always interesting and nearly always at the leading edge. 
I would recommend, um, ugh, I lost my last thing. There are fantastic list servers uh, like um, Above the Fold, Climate News. So poke around a bit and you'll find services that will send you collections of articles that were published uh, today. But most of all, I would look around amongst the people you know and the places you work because this change is happening everywhere. And so, you know, often one's tempted, well, I don't know enough. I'm not sure where to start. How do I begin? Just start. That's what I did. I had no idea what I was going to do in this space, but I tried things. And so that's what I would recommend. Uh, there are groups like Net Impact who are pulling together business people who are trying to make a difference and, and working with them. Uh, groups like the Center for Higher Ambition Leadership, where CEOs who want to be purpose-driven talk to each other. So decide what you want to do, experiment and reach out, and you will find amazing things. I, I saw a question about investing. There's a fabulous new book coming out, which is called something like How to Invest in renewables so you make money. <laughs> so, uh, so I will add that to the resources section of my website, but, uh, but keep a weather eye out. Oh, last but not least, the CEO of Fortune has a podcast and a newsletter where he talks to CEOs about these issues. I think if you're curious as to what's happening, that's another great resource to look at. You've given I us an agenda. Oh, Bill, I think we should say that we're past our time yep. so that if people would like to drop off the call, they're welcome to do so. I can stay around and uh, Bill and I can stay around for another uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, but if you'd like to go, of course, feel free to do so. And thank you very, very much for joining us. And, and, for and this is Sand. Hey, I don't Sam. know if you can see her. My husband just let her into the room where I'm sitting. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hint. It's after dinner or something <laughs> like that. That's um, right. That's right. My turn so to cook dinner. Before we, before we lose the people who are going to race off to dinner rather than <laughs> stick around, um, let me do my first of two deep thanks to you for both uh, being you, uh, doing the things you do, uh, writing the book, and uh, spending this time with us. It's been an as always, uh, an education and uh, delight, and uh, at least to me, uh, a, uh, a positive challenge for what, what can I and do I need to do differently. Um, I would say to our audience, um, a piece you didn't emphasize in your conclusions, yeah, it's important you keep up with this stuff yourself, think about your own actions, but talk about those actions to other people not to convince them to do this or that. It's on your mind. It's part of the conversation. It's what you think are important imponderables in life. And I think in this time of, of incredible X versus Y, everybody at loggerheads, the notion that I loved in the book was coming into this by saying part of reimagining is having the courage to talk about ill-formed possibilities of ways we might go, of what would be the strengths or the weaknesses of this, and having that conversation not just in the corridors of power, uh, but with your family, with your neighbors, with your friends. Um, and uh, that's how stuff builds. So thank you very, very much. Bill, thank you. You are a wonderful colleague and have been a leader in this field for many, many years. And uh, I love your closing suggestion. We don't know what a better world is going to look like. We have to work it out yeah. by talking to each other and right. trying new things out. It's beautifully, beautifully put. Thank you. And uh, uh, as you know, because you're, you're co-chairing uh, this Harvard President's uh, Committee on Sustainability, uh, we're finding just such exciting stuff coming in there from our colleagues in uh, literature and in the other parts of the humanities, precisely because of this notion of different ways of talking about alternative futures, different visions, different ways and perspectives of coming at things. And I think that's been uh, relative to the first passage we did on this together 10 years ago, uh, has been a 
a really exciting bit of progress in how Harvard, but I also know uh, from stuff you've told me about your discussions on corporate boards and so on, of the broadening this discussion to embrace uh, all the things we do as humans trying to be civilized, yeah. uh, rather than it being just a technical issue for business schools or for government schools or whatever. I mean, one of the pleasures of launching this book has been talking to such a wide range of groups. Um, I've, I've talked to literally thousands of people, which has been amazing. And it's been incredibly cheerful making because it's made me aware that there are hundreds of academics, for example, thinking about how they can reform their curriculums and what they can do and who are already like, I hate to say this, Bill, but there are schools like out in front of Harvard. <laughs> you know, there's been just some amazing stuff going on and talking to people in NGOs who are pushing so hard for change and are so thoughtful and engaged, talking to student groups, to large groups of investors. I mean, I think... Maybe I'm overgeneralizing. Sometimes maybe I'm over-optimistic, but I insist on remaining hopeful. There is so much going on in this space. It's really exciting and a huge change from a few years ago. Um, uh, it is indeed. When I look at what I was teaching as sustainable development uh, when I first got to Harvard, which is longer ago than I wish were true. Um, it was, I mean, I come up as an ecologist, so it was predictably a very ecologically oriented piece. And I can be embarrassed today that there was less of a balance in advancing the lives and well-being of people and doing it while not destroying the environment that future people would have to deal with. Right. But it it has taken that ongoing conversation to bring uh, me into what I would now say is where your comments on sustainability and so on fit, which is, uh, yes, we're interested ultimately in improving the lives of people now, elsewhere in the future. We recognize much more than we did 20, 30 years ago, how much doing that involves not just taking care of each other, but taking care of the planet. It's a moving trajectory. Yeah. Well, have you seen that wonderful book by our colleague Sam Myers at the School of Public Health, Planetary Indeed. Health? Indeed. Um, which is an incredible collaboration across huge numbers of scientists, basically trying to sort of build a picture of the health of the planet and linking that to human health. I mean, it, it's... It, it's a difficult book to read because so many of our critical ecosystems are in trouble and uh, so many key indicators are out of whack. But they focus on issues like, I mean, the wildfires in California lowered air quality below those found in, in heavily polluted cities like Delhi and, uh, and caused very significant increase in mortality. And, and why is it that taking care of the planet feeds directly into human health and, and vice versa. And these kinds of conversations are, are really, really exciting. And I think opening up new avenues for all of us. Um, indeed. Um, so I'm not quite sure how to do the, uh, um, the set of things here. Maybe we're, we're sort of down into the techies, but that's okay because we gave people a chance to escape. Um, for a long time, what people in at least looking at business from my distance were seeing, and several of our of our of our uh, listeners have brought this up, was a push to just in time delivery to very narrow margins to pushing labor costs down to the minimum. Uh, much of this leaving us in a situation that, as you just said, COVID exposed the problems of cutting ourselves down to the margins as though we actually knew what was going to happen. Um, it, as I recall reading through your book, one of the avenues you didn't choose to explore much of was this difference between the things that make sense from an efficiency perspective, even for somebody who isn't just a profit maximization for the quarterly report side, that is efficiency, narrow margins, low inventories, low wages, and the vision you're looking for, and the ability to survive surprises like COVID or like the 2008 collapse, um, 
and not be thrown completely off track and have people go back and retrench. Is, is that attitude changing at the B-School or? So I think more and more of us are talking about risk and system level risk and the importance of designing business systems so that they are resilient to these kinds of risks, whether it's a weather-related risk or a political risk or a cultural risk, that your consumers are going to say, no, you know, I'm not going to buy from you unless you do X, Y, Z. So I think that's a frame that is really starting to take hold. And I certainly see it amongst companies. You know, I think I saw that someone in the Q&A asked when I talked to a group of CEOs, do I start by saying this is the right thing to do or do I start by talking about the ROI? And the answer is I always talk about both, but I lead with ROI because that's the language of business. And I talk about the fact that we need to change our business models if we want to to survive as companies. And then I talk about the fact that, and you know this is, you know that this is the right thing to do. Because my experience is that one of the things that really embracing the larger mission, which is to make a difference in the world does, is allow firms to see more broadly and to mobilize support around taking risks and doing things in a different way. You know, we've got very used to managing for low cost and managing for efficiency. So managing instead for resilience and possibility is a very different thing to do. And I think what Purpose can do is sort of make the ROI possible, as it were, and we need to think of them as partners. But yes, all about risk, risks risks to the system. Uh, And maybe as our last piece, could I just ask you to expand a little bit on your the comments you've already made once but this concerns the financial sector and it's uh accelerating apparently reorientation to what do we count and uh you you referred to the carney initiative on uh risk disclosures vis-a-vis climate change to complement risk disclosures about nationalizing our industry and so on. You give us a little bit broader perspective on where you see that going as advice to investors versus the things we measure and report on and how that matters in this reimagining view. And then I will, in fact, let you escape. So this is a huge topic. And if you're interested in it, I would strongly recommend that you check out the work of my colleague at the business school, George Serafim. He was recently one of the founders of the Impact Weighting Accounting Initiative, which is all about measuring the impact that firms make. So, for example, he he and his colleagues recently released public access, a data set of 1,800 of the world's largest firms, that shows that 30% of these firms cause more environmental damage than their total profits. And another third cause more environmental damage than 25% of their profits. So he is helping to lead a movement towards measuring social and environmental impact. And his colleague, Sir Ronald Cohen, has recently published a book called Impact, which is all about this and well worth picking up. Um, Blackstone, the large private equity company, has recently announced that instead of just looking at risk and return in its investments, it's going to look at risk, return, and impact. Because it believes that those firms that minimize negative impact and maximize positive ones are likely to do much better going forward. And indeed, the work that's been done over the last six months suggests that those firms that are oriented to these questions of larger social and environmental impact are in fact receiving higher valuations than those firms that are not. Now, this is early days. Investors may be saying, whoa, you're taking care of some of those risks and that's what's going on. But it's incredibly interesting. I was talking to a group of very senior executives, mostly CEOs, and I was talking about this movement as the coming thing. And one of the participants, a woman who uh, had just left BlackRock said, Rebecca, why are you talking about this as if it's the coming thing? It's here. 
In every boardroom I'm in, in every discussion of investments, we talk about looking at the environmental, social impacts of what we're doing. Um, I'm on the board of a company that is a medical diagnostics company. We make big pieces of equipment to look at uh, pets, the health of pets. Great business, fabulous business called IDEX. And IDEX has moved aggressively towards embracing ESG and thinking about these issues for many reasons, but one of them is because the investors are insisting. <laughs> so the world is really changing. It's a very exciting time. It's clear that cat owners are out in front in what <laughs> they are uh, preaching and uh, what they're willing to invest in firms for. Uh, so uh, on, that, on that note, uh, rather than uh, anything less positive than more cats, um, <laughs> Uh, let me bring this to, to a somewhat belated close. Uh, thank all of you who uh, tuned in and stayed with it. Um, my apologies to those of you whose questions uh, I didn't get to. We'll, I'll continue to look at them and ponder them myself. Uh, and of course, my thanks as ever to Rebecca for all she does, uh, all the ways she challenges us, and all the ways she suggests, why not do this tomorrow morning? You could make the world a better place. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And my thanks to everyone who tuned in. Thank you for all that you do. Bye.